night, everybody. Good night. So we're live. Thank you for being here. And I'll be your moderator this evening. My name is Zoe Brown. And welcome to Fill the Facts online series presented by the International Decade of People of African Descent, the Youth Committee. So tonight, we have two young seasoned Guyanese with us. But before I begin, let me remind you, if you have any questions or comments, please leave it in the chat box and we'll answer them as soon as the panelists are finished presenting. So we have Andrea Bryan Garner. I'll give a brief introduction on both our panelists for tonight and then we'll dive in. We'll begin with Mr. Devonish and then we'll start with Ms. Andrea. Can everybody hear me? All right, great. So, Ms. Gardner has worked in the media for, 20, for the past 22 years. And for five of those years, she's worked in the state television at NCN as a TV and radio producer and presenter. Then she became a founding member, president and coordinator of an, of an award-winning child rights media, NGO, Youth Media Guyana, YMG. As a youth advocate, she also volunteered, volunteered with the Guyana National Youth Council and served as Guyana's representative to the UNDP Youth in Caribbean Youth Think Tank. As an entrepreneur, she is co-CEO of her own small production company, ProMedia, which started a decade ago, designed t-shirts with her own brand, Novelties, baked and decorated cakes under Sweet Sensations by Andrea. She also started Tasty, Tuesday, Tasty Tuesdays and Wings Wednesdays, deliveries and sold handmade fabric jewelry, greeting cards and personalized gifts. All while being a wife and mother of two, Andrea is a, is a student, is a graduate, sorry, of the University of Guyana and an avid lover of creative and culinary arts. She has a Guyana Folk Festival Award from the Guyana Cultural Association Association of NY, and she also has an award for Outstanding Women in Technology, Girls Tech and Change Guyana Award in 2019. So there we have Miss Andrea Bryan Garner. And also presenting for us tonight, we have Mr. Devonish, who is a state counsel at the Attorney General's Chamber and a lecturer and tutor at the University of Guyana. He possesses a bachelor's degree in law and international relations from the University of Guyana and worked as a journalist and lecturer of politics before pursuing a career in law. He was the valedictorian of his year, 2019 class from the U. Wooding Law School, where he served as vice president of the student government, a writer and editor for the school's new letter and founder and lead implementer of the school's LLB outreach initiative. He was also president of the University of Ghana Law Society, secretary of the Students Association of Trinidad and Tobago, and a member of its Constitutional Reform Committee, as well as interim committee member of the Ghana National Youth Council, and chairman of its Rules and Constitutional Reform Committee. While pursuing his LLB, Mr. Devonish also worked as a research assistant for the Steering Committee on Constitutional Reform a consultant for the International Labour Organization and Guyana Citizen Security Strengthening Program, and an intern at Fraser Halstrey and Yearwood Attorneys at Law. So there we have Mr. Devonish and Ms. Andrea. They'll be presenting tonight on our topic, seeing and seizing opportunities. And I hope we're, I know we're all eager to ask questions because our inquisitive minds, God knows we can't control them. So we'll start with Mr. Devonish, and after Mr. Devonish, we'll have Ms. Andrea. Please remember to leave your questions and your comments in the chat box. Thank you. Mr. Devonish, the floor is yours. Good night, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to the organization committee members for affording me this opportunity. Oh, by the way, I live, on a, I live on Norton Street, right? So if you hear music from time to time, it's the buses breaking curfew or the vehicles breaking curfew. My apologies on their behalf. Um, and also GTNT is um, being very 
<clears throat> creative with my internet from time to time. So if I go in and out, just bear with me for a couple of seconds. Uh, as I was saying, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with uh, young people um, today or tonight on this subject. It's something that is very near and dear to me, and it's something that I've been able to employ to assist my, um, I, I should say, my development. Uh, I want to also say as a disclaimer that everything I'm going to say tonight is really based on my experiences, my lived experience, and uh, other experience that I've observed and researched, which I found to work. I'm going to divide my presentation into three parts. These headings are referred to as are the, what I refer to as opportunity recognition. That's the first one. Uh, opportunity creation and opportunity maximization. The first two to some extent overlapping at times. And I'm going to try to talk to you about how you can leverage opportunity recognition, creation and maximization in a manner to allow you uh, the success that perhaps doing. I want to also say though that um, I do believe that society has a very jaundiced perception of uh, what ambition is and um, what it means to have ambition. Because, you know, there, there, there are persons in society who may not necessarily have very quote unquote lofty ideals and goals and ambitions. Persons who are just quite satisfied to earn enough to live from day to day, have some savings and be generally comfortable. And if that is something that you aspire to, then that is quite fine. And you know, no one in no system should make persons feel uncomfortable or embarrassed if that is what they aspire to. That being said, I move forward. Opportunity recognition. This is what I refer to as being able to, as the term states, recognize opportunities, especially in things and places that you would not necessarily think that opportunities exist and also and also recognizing uh, things as opportunities that you wouldn't uh, ordinarily recognize to be an opportunity and what what do i mean when i say this and some of the examples of these things of of, of recognizing opportunities in places that they're not for, is for example um, volunteering. Now, volunteering is a very good way for you to gain a whole range of experiences, but I find um, I've been lecturing and tutoring since about 2011, and because of my own interest in volunteering and what I've seen volunteering do for people, I've always tried to encourage students to volunteer, and so I've, I tend to ask my classes, the students volunteering, whether they volunteer, whether they're interested in interested in volunteering and in most of those classes most of the times in the vast majority of cases um the feedback has been that uh, those particular young people in my classes at least um did not bring because they did not see any tangible benefits uh volunteering so so one of the things one of the examples that i want to put is volunteering um and as I was saying, there are whole other skill sets that you can develop through volunteering that you can bring to bear uh, in other areas of your life. So you can develop skills such as project management, project coordination, facilitating community uh, projects, community mobilization, accounting skills, and a whole host of other skills. Um, some of the skills that I was able to use are the skills that I garnered while I was a volunteer University of Ghana in the Law Society's Committee on Constitutional Reform, and that worked quite well for me. Uh, another thing that I want to, another example that I want to point out is uh, networking as an opportunity. I'm sure that enough persons recognize how important networking is. Now, it's important to distinguish uh, a direct dichotomy between using people and uh, being and curating your network. There are quite a few persons out there who are just interested in meeting people so that they can use them um, more or less. However, quite often you're involved in other things and persons who have other uh, areas of interest to either um, advance yours. So I was saying that I was able to meet persons from different places, different islands, and the, the intention was not to to 
use those pieces as vessels to further myself. And we became friends or we became close or colleagues or, or what's not. And what I have found after studying is that if I need to know the situation in Barbados, for example, I know for in Bar um, something in, in Trinidad or in a particular island, I can reach out to one of those persons. So the value of uh, having a network is uh, you know, innumerable and you can get those things from volunteering. Writing is also is a very underestimated um, which you can use to, to create opportunities for yourself. And a lot of persons don't recognize the opportunities in writing. Writing is one of the ways that you put yourself out there and you can really establish yourself as a serious, for example, commentator. I noticed that um, Mr. Gall, for example, has written on several occasions. Um, and uh, I think an article was written on him recently about him submitting something to the Ministry of um, Finance. And there are persons who Mr. Gall probably do not know who are my colleagues and my friends, and they would have engaged me in conversations about his proposals. And that is because he put him, uh, I just wanna say that I think that, while I understand why too many young people are not necessarily willing uh, to put themselves out under the limelight because it can backfire if you do not do it well, but where it is done well, it opens a host of doors. So writing, whether it be uh, by way of letters to the editor or whether it be blogging and uh, is, an, is an opportunity which is underutilized. And for the persons who do utilize it, I wanna say that I think that those persons have seen those, those uh, avenues open doors for them. Again, if I'm to use myself for an, as an example, because as I said, I'm using my own experiences. Uh, a couple of years ago, I started writing on topics that were interesting to me and that I had some amount of interest in course, having done research and what's not. And uh, there are a couple of places that I went for different reasons, social and otherwise. And I met persons who told me that they read my work, who I never believed uh, would have read my work or who I didn't think would have access to my work. And that also opened doors for me. And that led me to recognize writing as an opportunity, which is not really utilized. So a lot of persons tend to focus more on things uh, such as official publications and what's not, but those are very uh, far in between opportunities. And writing, like blogging, allows you to write much more and uncover a wider uh, area of things. So that is something to consider. Also businesses and, and NGOs. I'm not gonna go too much into this because uh, I, I think that this is perhaps an area that Andrea can uh, speak to perhaps better than I can, but if you can identify the existence of a need in society and uh, you can fulfill that need uh, through establishing a non gov or being part of a non governmental organization or, 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 or a business, that is something that can work for you as well. But you must be able to recognize uh, these things as opportunities, you must be able to recognize opportunities. Uh, I think that one of the things that helps, and this goes across the topics that I am going to be speaking on, that is recognition, um, maximization, and creation, is having a sense of purpose. That has helped me tremendously because I think that once I figure out what I believe my purpose is, I began to view the world and different phenomena in a I believe my purpose to be. And I started to see things in terms of how it can help me develop to achieve my purpose. Uh, and and it, it also allows you to manage your time so that you can determine whether or not you can, you, you're willing to do something which does not help you to achieve your purpose. Of course, that does not mean, for example, that you don't rest and engage in leisure activities because those are just as important as um, working. Um, but I also wanna say that another example is something as simple as an internship. I think that too many persons rely on the WTO or the United Nations or some very lofty established entities to provide internship, op internship opportunities where the reality is there are any manner of, any number of organizations, entities, NGOs or commercial operations which are willing to provide internships to persons and all you really need to do is ask. And when I was at University of Guyana, we just went around to some law firms and asked firms what they were, able, were willing to take students and it took quite a few which students were able to benefit um, profusely from those, those initiatives. 
I'm going to rush on quickly to opportunity creation and the, the, the name speaks for itself. And like I said, it kind of is, is connected to opportunity realization. So even if opportunities are not available to you by virtue of someone offering an opportunity to you or you being able to apply to do something, create an opportunity for yourself. Writing. So recognizing writing as an opportunity is one thing but creating the opportunity for yourself by putting your position to benefit from that writing is com something completely different. So after recognizing that writing is an opportunity, you must now proceed to that point and actually begin to write or begin to blog. And that is when you're able to create an opportunity for yourself because you become noticed and uh, perhaps doors can open for you. Of course, it doesn't mean that these things are guaranteed, eh? but you know it creates that probability, if not a possibility, which is very important. And the last thing that I want to talk on, because I'm being mindful not to speak too much, is what I refer to as um, opportunity maximization. And this simply means make the best out of every opportunity that comes your way, whether it's an opportunity that was given to you or whether it's an opportunity which you have created for yourself. Because when you get that opportunity to really uh, demonstrate your competency, you should not waste any time or spare any effort to demonstrate that you're a competent, capable individual. We've all heard the saying that it's not just about what who you know, but who knows you. It's also about what those people know about you because it's quite possible, and I've seen this, for you to have the best grades, but you do not have a demonstrated ability to work. And when I say you don't have the demonstrated ability to work, I just mean that it has not been demonstrated in the faces of people who have the, the ability to give you opportunities. And this is where things like internship, you know, internships come, come, come in. Unfortunately, too many persons are not willing to work um, for no money. And of course, I understand that a lot of persons are not in a financial position to work for uh, no money. But if you do, it is something that you should do because it helps you again to maximize these opportunities. So when you get an opportunity, when you create it, or when it is given to you and you make the best of that, whether it's working completely and totally during that you have also putting in the work uh, behind the scene uh, during your non-work hours, it really has the propensity to reap benefits for you. And I've seen that work in life uh, as well. Now, it does not mean that you just, for example, submit work five days before the due date or two due date. Sometimes it means Finishing for the deadline, and this is just one example, but submitting the day of, or on the deadline, the day of perhaps a couple of hours before, you know, the deadline. So that uh, you really create your competency. And it say is that getting one opportunity should not necessarily mean that you know other opportunities. If you can uh, multitask in the sense of doing several things simultaneously, in and, and writing or something of the nature, but involved in several projects simultaneously, and you can do that effectively, it is something that you should aspire to because one of the things that I realize is that employers or members of organizations value persons who are able to uh, divide their time. Uh, they give equal attention and good attention to all of the tasks that they have to do. I remember specifically in 2016, this was my second year of university, and I was doing much. I, I actually thought I was drowning. I was preparing for a Mulan. I was president of the Law Society at the time. I was uh, a mem the research assistant in the steering committee and constitutional reform and several other things. And I literally felt that I was drowning, but I, I was still struggling to uh, distribute my time sufficiently between all of these, these things and also find time for sleep and family and doing house chores and, and working because I, was, I, I had a job as well. And I wanted to drop a couple of these things, but my personal economic circumstances uh, did not. So, and I also saw doing these things as my way to elevate myself and it worked. So because some persons that I worked with at the, uh, at the level of this committee actually recognized my ability to do these things and they gave me opportunities. So from that, doing my best, I was given an opportunity to intern at a firm and that firm, uh, after me having interned for a couple of months with it and seeing my work ethic and how I can, and how I, I think, they offered to pay my tuition completely 
uh, in, in Trinidad, which I was expecting. So again, I'm not talking about these things to boast, but just to show you how uh, these things can benefit you uh, if you maximize the opportunities that you are given. And, and it is, you know, it's very important. I also want, and I'm coming to the end, I also want to is that you um, be careful to exercise restraint, learn how to say no, and learn how to know your limitations. It makes no sense you, you, you're given or you create several opportunities and you're operating or functioning mediocre in each of these areas. It will work against you. It will change your rep reputation and damage your prospects for the future. Also, uh, it's very important for you to not do too much. Rest is very important. So rest is also an, an, a very good opportunity and maximization of your opportunity to rest is very important because if you're not well rested, then it affects negatively your ability to do good work. Uh, and I think I'm gonna close on that point. Thank you, Mr. Devanish. Um, Ms. Garner, you can go ahead. Uh, please remember if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the chat box. Okay, well, good night, everyone. Um, I'm not gonna be very long. I just want to talk about my own personal experiences and about three things I want to focus on. And that is about seizing the opportunities. Um, in fact, I like the fact that the topic has seeing and seizing opportunities because in order to seize something, you have to see it first. To see it, to seize it, you have to see it. And because so many things begin in your mind and it's all about your vision. And in fact, that is the slogan for my production company that I started. It starts with a vision because once you can see that thing manifested in your mind, you can now know what to work towards in order to achieve it. And if you think about a fruit perhaps hanging on a tree, it, it's something that you need to grab. You have to see it in order to do so. I mean, you could feel around, feel your way around and eventually get it, but that is like a, a look and chance sort of thing. So I really want to emphasize about envisioning the possibilities. And I think with this COVID pandemic, it's the perfect time for us to have some time to be still and to look at what are some of the problems in our society that need solving. And that has to do with um, being able to find an answer for those problems if you're looking at opportunities in business. Because remember, opportunities are not only about economic opportunities. There could be social opportunities. For instance, when I started in volunteerism, um, basically I didn't know what would come after, but I saw a need and wanted to assist with different causes. And those things led to other things like a domino effect. Um, for instance, just seeing an application and applying, you have to be proactive and do something in order to have a result. For instance, the, uh, when I was a, the Ghana representative for the youth think tank, the Caribbean youth think tank, um, they just asked you to submit a form saying what is your dream for the Caribbean. And I just submitted something and I, after a series of short listing, I was successful. But that act of itself in applying and just taking a chance it led to a, a, an opportunity because now as a Ghana representative, they suddenly told you send your passport information. You have to fly to this country for a workshop or another country to assist another Caribbean representative. So I didn't apply thinking about that would be the end result, but one thing can definitely lead to another and create opportunities. Um, in terms of coming up with the ideas, you have to think of what your niche is what you're good at. Um, not everything that you're good at is necessarily a good business idea, but business of itself is about making a profit. That is one thing I learned very early on. Business is about making a profit. Otherwise, you, you're starting a charity or an NGO if you're not interested in making a profit. And so it's not about starting a business based on something that you like alone. You have to do some research you have to do some sort of feasibility study to know what the market is, to know if this is something that other persons will buy. Because if you're starting a business, you always have to keep in mind to make a profit. Do the research. Find out from friends and family if this is something you're interested in. Because, for instance, look, even if there is a good idea, a few years ago when Uber started around the world, um, suddenly in Guyana there were driver apps. There were about three companies that started driver apps in Guyana. But where are they now? Perhaps the feasibility study wasn't done to know that even if you have this service available, not everyone can access it. 
pay for it, have the data to be able to track when a car is coming or the drivers to be able to have data while driving around to know when their next pickup is scheduled. So these are things that we need to do before getting into business because once you do that, without any sort of evidence-based approach, your business is likely to fail. And as they say, most businesses take about three years before you can really see a profit for a startup because of the initial large investment. Um, but of course, persons might say, well, how are you gonna access financing if you want to start your own business or you see an opportunity and you need an investor? And this is where it comes back to being proactive, looking for grants. Um, there are a number of opportunities for young people right now that you just have to tap into. I know the Department of Youth, they have a number of programs. Um, the Small Business Bureau, once you're a registered business, and it's $5,000 to register a business you now. Uh, I think they're closed because of COVID, but they'll be opening soon. But those are things that you just need to do, get yourself certified, get your business registered to be able to access um, financing and grants and so on. Up, on. Even today, I did an interview on television with someone who benefit, benefited from a cultural grant, and that allowed them to be able to publish their own book, as Chevy was talking about writing. If you have that skill and it's something that you want to produce, now his book is selling on Amazon. It's sold out at local bookstores. Persons around the world are also buying his book. I actually have it right here because I have to read it. Um, I had to read it for the interview. So, I mean, it's things like that. Getting access to grants, you could really achieve what you want to do once you're able to do some research and find ways to do so. Because even if you think about what our ancestors went through, they didn't wait until, well, there was a bank for the um, freed Africans and a grant to, to give out land and so on. They literally pooled coins in wheelbarrows and were able to buy their own piece of land. And that brings me to challenges because of course they face a number of challenges even to get that land to be able to produce, to live off the land because there was always an obstacle um, with more taxes levied on them access to irrigation and so on, but they didn't let that stop them. Um, they tried to find ways around that and to work as a collective. And I think that's important. If we want to achieve certain things, if you can't do it individually, it's time to look at being a grouping to help one another and, and perhaps have that same box hand idea that our grandparents and parents um, knew about. Move it from a micro level to a macro level if there's a need to access financing. And finally, I think it's always important to make a list. I'm always making lists in terms of, you know, what I think are some of the needs and those needs that I could meet. And like I said before, thinking of what I'm good at or what you're good at. And even if you're not good at something, there may be other persons who are good at it that you can harness. And one story I could particularly remember, um, a, a person who owned a, a furniture store and he had his carpentry factory, but he knows absolutely nothing about carpentry. All he does is provide the equipment and he hires all these skilled workmen, carpenters. They build it for him. He pays them a minimal fee and sells the same things that these guys could make on their own for much, much more in his store. So it, and in order to get the equipment, he access um, financing from a micro lending agency. So I think those are things that could be done by anyone once you have the vision. Um, as I said before, challenges are faced. Uh, challenges, it, it's a part of life. Um, for instance, it, it, it depends on how you deal with those challenges and how you overcome those challenges. I, I faced challenges. I had a best friend who died suddenly from asthma two years ago, and it really you know, affected me even so at a physical level um, and grief and so on. Then before that, I, during the Zika virus outbreak, my daughter was born with, with, with microcephaly. So yes, you are gonna face challenges, but you can't just wallow in them and allow them to control your life and the opportunities that you might see before you. So that's basically it in a nutshell. And if there are questions you have, feel free and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you, Ms. Garner. Um, while we wait for questions, I'd like to encourage you to like our Facebook page. 
on our Instagram page. It's um, Epidity Youth Movement and International Decade for People of African Descent Assembly, Guyana, and Epidity's official page. So while we wait again, I have a question for Mr. Devinish. So let's paint a scenario. Let's say one of our participants, they have a heavy workload and they're a final year student at the University of Guyana and they volunteer a lot. They feel very taxed and very stressed out, but they don't want to drop any one of their activities that they're doing, although they realize that graduating is what's important right now. What advice would you give to them? Well, you know, that question actually reminds me of somebody that I know who's at the University of Guyana right now. So I'm wondering if, 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 if that person is the, who asked the question. And what I would say is this, the person has to identify what is most important to them. Uh, how they want to graduate, that is your GPA, what quality GPA you want, what you want to do with your GPA, or what you want to take from the University of Guyana beside your GPA. Um, um, I was never really interested in, in getting a very good GPA necessarily. I enjoyed extracurricular things at school, uh, student government, uh, volunteering, being part of the, the committee that I spoke about just now. But I also recognize the importance of, of GPA to getting a, a um, scholarship, for example. So I did just enough in terms of work. I did just well enough intentionally to allow me to continue doing else that I wanted to do, including procrastinate, because there was a sizable amount of procrastination, which I enjoyed doing, because while I procrastinated, um, I was doing the things that I like, such as play video games and watch anime and, and, and other things like that. But there was also some work. There was also volunteering. Um, and I was able to achieve that particular goal. So what I would say to that person is identify what is most important to you. Is graduating with a very good GPA most important to you? Or is ensuring that you continue to get the benefit of the things that you're doing while at the university most important to you? Uh, and ensure that you won't regret the decision that you make when you make that decision because you don't want to uh, prioritize the things that you're doing and you graduate with a decent gpa but it's not as as it's not good enough for to for example get you a scholarship if you realize you may be looking for a scholarship um a little later so you must learn to balance and if you find that you you prioritize getting a good gp but everything else that you're doing is getting in the way of that and the answer is clear. Or if you realize that what you prioritize is the extracurricular aspects uh, of what you get from that, you really prioritize your GPA that much, you, you may still get the don't need it 3.7, 3.6, uh, 3.5, then you, you can uh, manage your time in such a way that you dedicate sufficient time to work, but also sufficient time to doing everything that you're doing in the extracurricular field. So you have to find that balance based on what you see at the end of the period that you're currently going through. Um, well, I noticed a question in the chat about what strategies I would use to identify opportunities that are best suited um, for me or for anyone. And for me, like I said, I write a list and I tend to observe society to think about what problem needs solving and what problem is something that could result in revenue. And you just need to look around. I think opportunities are always there for you to seize, which it ties into the topic tonight, seeing and seizing the opportunity. For instance, right now we know children are home um, out of school and they need lessons or education being taught to them in a virtual way because of the measures, um, the stay home measures and so on. That is an opportunity right there. I'm sure most persons in this Zoom room have high school education or they're at university and so on. Maybe as a group, you could form a kind of tutoring club and you have persons pay via MMG or you know somehow you can collect cash um, on a weekly basis and you offer these tutoring opportunities based. The syllabus is right online on, on the Ministry of Education 
websites. And so that in itself is an opportunity that I just came up with right there that people can tap into, especially young people. And you would, you would be home if you have internet, you could use WhatsApp, you could use Zoom, and you can offer um, tutoring sessions where uh, it might not be offered by that child's school. So it's just a matter of thinking what is needed, what can you offer to fill that need, and how can you monetize it? Thank you, Ms. Garner. I have another question for you. I think earlier you mentioned um, two years, um, that time you just took that leap of faith and you wrote that letter and then you, it watered down and you got accepted. Um, what the person would like to know is what motivated you to take that leap of faith and write that letter that you wrote that got you accepted? Like, well, what motivated you? That was a funny story um, because I wasn't even going to apply to be the, the Guyana rep uh, for that particular initiative. It was on the night of the deadline. I saw it online I, or someone sent it to me. Um, probably, I, I can't really remember how I got it, but I saw a flyer and it was just saying, are you a young person between whatever? And I think 29 it was at the time because I'm way older than that now. <laughs> But um, basically they were asking you, what is your dream for the Caribbean? What would you like to see for your country? You have to submit if it's a song. Or, I didn't even have a song or anything. I just kind of bluffed and submitted a photo of the sunset. And I said, I see the Caribbean rising like the sun, some poetic thing. <laughs> but it was enough to get the attention of the person who were doing the short list. And sometimes you just have to think outside the box and think about what could make you stand out from the rest of the crowd um, in terms of how, how you present yourself, how you're selling yourself. Because at the end of the day, you want your submission to be considered. And it, it, it was. And um, after that, it, there was a phone call interview. So they really want to know about my volunteerism. And as Chevy said, that's where it's important. Because even if you don't have working experience, your volunteerism sets a kind of background for you and, and a, a solid foundation for you to grow and where persons could see that you have dedication, you're committed yeah. to something, um, you're good at teamwork. So these are soft skills that we probably take for granted, but that is where young people can start um, in building their whole portfolio. Thank you, Ms. Garner. Um, Mr. Devinish, there's a question here for you. Concerning the aspect of seizing I saw Mr. Glass question. Okay, so you can go right ahead and answer. Um, but but with, 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 with respect to the first question, I want to say that for me, um, how I identify opportunities that are best suited to me are is really by determining whether or not it aligns with my competencies, my interests and um, what I'm in, what, where I'm interested in going because I know what I'm at least competent in. I know what I'm interested in, I guess, as in, in the moment, but I also know what I want to be in or what I perhaps should seek to be interested in. One of the things that I'm keen on is being, and being fun for me does not mean boxing myself into the four corners Example, or the areas that I have studied, but also paying attention to Guyanese society or economy. Um, and as, as I've mentioned before, as Andrea mentioned before, recognizing what are the needs of society um, or what is important to society, whether or not you can be competent uh, and whether you're interested uh, in doing that thing. And when you answer those questions, you can determine what opportunities are out there are best for you. Uh, of course, sometimes there are, there are some opportunities, but they're not best for you because you're not qualified for those opportunities. And I say sometimes, and depending on what the opportunity is, go for it anyway. You can learn to do what you're required to do after you accept the, the opportunity. Now, this does not mean that you completely throw yourself off a bridge into whatever opportunity exists. Um, but if there's something that allows you to learn while you're on the job, then I say go. When I was doing the internship at Fraser Houston, year would 
No, I, I, I didn't do sixth form. I did first year law, but I wasn't this off with things like writing opinions, etc. And my seniors were giving me work and then telling me, do this, do that, without any guidance as to how to go about doing it. And it was completely new territory for me. So what I had to do is go do research and learn um, really by, by, by trial and error. So that, that is the formula, or at least one of the formulas that I used to determine um, how, how, what opportunities are good for me. Now, with respect to Mr. Gall's question, um, fear of failure, the, the only way to overcome fear, you know that you ever overcome fear of failure because you can fear failure, but persist nevertheless. Um, you can be in the process of doing something and still be afraid of failing. And in my mind, that is fine. And the, the fact of the matter is sometimes you may fail, but failure really should not be an impediment. Because if, if Bill Ryan is concerned, for example, if you write a letter in the newspaper, news, where a certain socioeconomic class of Guyanese, um, which uh, relate to, to get their news, you're putting yourself out there to the business class to a significant extent. And some persons who have the propensity to either give you opportunities or deny you opportunities based on what you see. And that reality can be crippling. But there is nothing that you can do about that beside prepare yourself to capitalize on the opportunity which exists. So if what if the opportunity is writing, what are you doing to overcome any limitations that you have pertaining to writing? If the opportunity is in public speaking, what are you doing to build up your competency and capability in public speaking? Because I don't think that the fear of failure necessar necessarily needs to subside, but what you need to do nevertheless is become more competent in the area that you want to venture into the area that you're given this opportunity or the area in which you created this opportunity for yourself. Entrepreneurs, I, I would think all the time, are always afraid of the, the fear of the failure of their business. But if you allow that fear to, to cripple you, then you will never progress. So you have to ask yourself, what do you prefer to do? Move forward despite that fear of failure and see whether you will fail and succeed. And even if you fail, get up and try again or you, whether you will allow that fear to prevent you from, from never um, moving forward to begin with. Um, I see, well, I'll, I'll allow the moderator to moderate, but I see uh, two other questions here, but because that, that question was specifically, we we're about to ask that question, I'll, I'll stop on at this point. Thank you, Mr. Devinish. So there's a question from our FE family. Thank you for joining in for both Mr. Devinish and Ms. Garner. They're asking, where can you find opportunities for volunteerism? Well, where can you find opportunities here in Guyana for volunteerism? Yes, um, well, in Guyana, there are quite a number of youth groups. Um, Chevy could attest to this being a part of the Guyana National Youth Council as well. Um, there, there are definitely youth groups on, you can find, just go to Guyana National Youth Council you would see a number of um, persons there who are part of voluntary organizations. There is the VSP platform, which is part of the Department of Youth. They actually have a, a, a directory of all the youth groups who register with them. So it's just a matter of finding one in your area. I mean, with COVID right now, they can't necessarily meet physically, but um, you, I'm sure there are online outlets for young people to be able to engage with groups in their particular region or community. And if one doesn't exist, you form your own. Uh, with YMG, it was a group of seven of us. We went to a workshop uh, learning about youth and media, and we decided, hey, when we come back to Ghana, we don't just want the, the work to stop at the workshop. We want to be able to continue. And we didn't really know what would be there to tap into it, but we, we organized ourselves. And as a result of that, we then, as a, as a group, as a collective, we could have put forward proposals to, to different international agencies and so on to secure funding to get our program rolled out. So as I said before, opportunities are there. You have to see it, you have to envisage it. 
if it if it doesn't exist, create it. And speaking to what Chevy was talking about, answering Matthew Gall's question about overcoming the fear of failure and developing a courageous mindset. Listen, it's almost inevitable for a startup that you will fail in some way or the, or the other. So just accept that you're not going to hit the ground running and get everything right the first time. Failure is an opportunity to learn from what mistakes may have been made and to grow. So don't see failure as a negative thing. Um, I, I came up with things to start different ideas and had to squash them because it didn't really, it wasn't executed how I thought it would happen. And you have to know when to let things go and maybe start over and do something else. Not everything um, necessarily has to be monetized. If you have a talent, some things are really meant to be hobbies. I, I even had to learn that myself because everything that I thought I was good that I was thinking, hey, I could sell this or create a business. And you can't do anything all at once. You're going to burn out at some point. So try to focus on what you're really good at, what has a market for it, and look at that. For instance, um, there's a guy that sells mitai. To me, this is the best mitai I've ever tasted. I think his name is Sugar. He doesn't really sell anything but mitai. He sells the best mitai in town. But some people might be like, okay, my metai is selling out. Maybe I should also do some cheese rolls or something. But you're not good at making cheese rolls. Stick to what you're good at. And you will definitely find a market and a customer base for that. Thank you, Ms. Gaia. Mr. Devnish, would you like to comment on the question asked or the pause? Well, I think I think that Andrea sufficiently answered the, the first question. So I don't think there's anything for that. All right, very well. So we have a question from Norwell. Many of us have sound ideas, but no capital nor adequate supportive structures. We are also afraid of people with capital stealing our good ideas. He's asking if you've ever faced these challenges, what strategies did you use to overcome them? To overcome them? Both of you. Well, I guess I could start there with the whole entrepreneurship thing. Once you have something that's good, they're going to be copycats. That is almost inevitable. And that is why it's important that you first in the market and probably if possible, if you could like flood the market, but I know that comes back to a capital issue. And that's where I think it's a case where you need to be able to get some persons to back you if it's your family and your friends. And so before you even let that idea out into the public, you ensure that you have everything concrete and you're ready to hit the ground running because persons are going to run behind you or run in front of you if they have more capital to invest and to produce what you're doing. But for me, my strategy is to always find something that makes my product stand out, um, like I said, with the Mitai. Um, there's, there are hundreds of Mitai producers in Guyana. But this guy has some sort of trade secret that makes his life an airy. And he found a way to make his better than the rest. So that's what you need to do to be able to um, be ahead of the of the curve. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Devnish, do you have anything to add? But I think tomorrow, this Chevy doesn't have anything to add. It comes back, it comes back to what I said earlier about creating um, capital as groups, as collect as collectives, um, being able to harness that source of funding. So if there's a good idea, you can actually apply to this grouping of your own peers or or even an organization such as this to be able to have um, you know small loans available. So that when you have an idea, you can execute it quickly without having to go around the whole aspect of, of seeking financing from um, other established institutions, which may have barriers to persons who don't have that experience or who don't have the collateral that is necessary if they want to do certain things. And it comes back to not waiting on others to provide that but pooling resources to do that for ourselves. Great. Um, another Facebook question. 
How important is stepping out of one's comfort zone? Debbie, I'll let you take that. <laughs> Um, with respect to the question, I I really much about the area of entrepreneurship. I will take what Andrea said as as the authority in that particular position. But as someone who is interested in starting up, home, one of the things that I have been doing is keeping my ideas uh, private for the time and sharing it largely with persons that I trust, which is just a couple of persons while I um, finish visualization and move towards registration and the point where we actually start to. So, because when I, when I started, I was seeking feedback from it and it was just one person who cautioned me and said, well, you know, this is a very good idea, but you perhaps don't want to publicize it too much as yet because there may be other persons in society who may hear about it, think it's a good idea, and they may be able to roll it out faster than you can. So one of the things I would recommend is that you be very careful with who you share your ideas with and perhaps you not be open about what you're planning to do until you're in a position to actually do it and do it well. Thank you. I think your internet problem caused you not to hear me, but the question directed at you was, how important is it to step out of your comfort zone? Great. It is absolutely important for you to step out of your comfort zone because I experience some of the best things that you will ever experience lies beyond your comfort zone. Um, so much of what I've been able to achieve, I've been able to do so because I dare to be uncomfortable. And sometimes that means doing um things that you are not necessarily that knowledgeable of so that you gain that knowledge or doing multiple things, things simultaneously to perhaps develop the ability to manage your time well or to prioritize. Time management is one thing because when you're managing your time, managing your time or according to, uh, across a spectrum of things that you have allotted yourself to do. Prioritization is very important and should come before time management because that is at which you decide what is most important to you. I think that sometimes we should prioritize things that are outside of our comfort zone because it is in the realm of our comfort zone that we're able to grow and develop more competent in a range of things than we were competent in before. And it is at this point that we can see more opening and more opportunities being availed to us. I mean, just consider this. If what you're comfortable with accounting, but you're interested in economics or even law, but you are, but you don't think that you can perhaps do law and you allow that fear of getting into that realm to stymie that progress, it means that you will never venture into that area. And all of the benefits that are waiting for you if you go into that area and if you function well in that area are never made available to you. And that is a very important thing to consider. And uh, in light of what I've said before, your comfort zone can take several natures. It can take the form of you not wanting to, for example, work beyond your stipulated working hours. Now, while it is all fine and well to decide that I am contracted to work in between this time or I an indication to the organization that this is the time that um, I will be working. There is also a very important question, uh, that question being, what are the gains that can come from working beyond your designated work hours or sometimes into the morning, one, two, three, four o'clock? I'm not saying make this a practice necessary, but I'm saying sometimes you should go above and beyond your um, your, your temporal or time-related comfort zones in order for you to achieve what was not previously uh, um, open to you to achieve. So uh, to, to go back to the answer to the question, it is very important for you to step, step out of your, your, your comfort zone if you want to do more. However, if you're just okay in, with, with doing 
what whatever it is that you're doing and you're not aspiring to some of the some of the, the lofty ideals that you're seeing and if you don't want to be involved in several sectors then it is completely fine uh, in staying within your comfort zone and i'm just making this point because again i want to emphasize that if you just comfortable having considered everything you're comfortable doing a then do not let society uh, shame you or belittle you into thinking that you need to also do b c or d because that is what society uses to determine your value or your worth. Otherwise, step out of your comfort zone. For me, with their comfort zone, um, if you're comfortable in something, you wouldn't want to change. So sometimes there is a need to, to step out of that, to be able to force yourself to uh, come to a new realization and change from, from what the point that you are at that point to where you need to be. Um, of course, there are things that you, if you're looking at business and what you're good at and if you're comfortable doing, I wouldn't advise persons to change from that necessarily into, into totally uncharted waters where they don't know what they're doing. But um, for me, stepping out from your comfort zone is when you realize that there's something, part of your personality, a trait that you need to change because really you can train yourself to think differently. Um, for instance, uh, I, I often read a lot of positivity books and how to, to you know, not let challenges that you face keep you down because you can let what happens to you um, decide what you do. But at the end of the day, only you can control how you react to certain situations in life. And that is where you step out from your comfort and realize what you need to change to get where you're going. Um, yeah, that's my response about, about stepping out of your comfort zone. Uh, entrepreneurship is not for everybody. I must ensure I say that. I worked for myself for 10 years, for a whole decade, and it was hard. You basically have to earn every single dollar that you're getting there, as opposed to maybe the sense of security you might have working for an employer where you have that fixed salary coming in at the end of the month. But as an entrepreneur, you're not even sure if you're going to make any money that particular month. So you have to plan ahead and really, really work hard on whatever it is that you're doing. So entrepreneurship is not for everybody, um, but it's something that you can definitely benefit from and plan ahead and go for it if, if you think you have what it takes. Thank you, Ms. Garner. So we're down to our last three questions and then we'll wrap up. We have a question from Zigba. This is directed towards you, Ms. Garner. He's asking, how can we develop customer trust in our business and keep it? Well, that's a good question. Um, customer trust, I think it, it comes to service, good customer service and quality of your product of, or your service. That's the only way a customer is going to trust you. And like I said, initially, business is about making profit. And the best way to make profit is to have return customers. You don't want a product that is not good or bad service. Yes, you collect the money from the customer the first time, but they don't come back. Plus, that would have a domino effect in that they're going to tell people not to buy your product or service. So you're now affecting future, you're affecting potential customers as well. So if you you need to build a, a brand of integrity, a brand where you know that your customers are going to keep coming again and again. What I did when I used to do my um, sweet sensations by Andrea with cakes and I used to do like um, small finger foods and things like that. But I really was into desserts and I would give a little freebie to my customers and say, here's an extra treat. And that made them come back and even order more and then refer me to other persons and so on. So you have to treat your customer well. You have to provide a quality product that you yourself would want to buy. Um, because spending disposable income is, is a choice by the customer. So you have to entice them to want to, to take that money out of their pocket and hand it to you to put into yours. Thank you, Ms. Garner. A question from Matthew. Are there any specific challenges you guys face as persons of African descent 
as it relates to seizing your opportunities? I think this is a very relatable question. Well, Chevy, I don't know if you want to go first. I do have my stories I'll share after. All right, well, perhaps I could go. I think Chevy thinking about all. Uh, I, um, I was trying to remember because if there have, I am either not remembering them or I perhaps did not see them because for as long as I'm, I'm thinking about my career, I have not seen, uh, I have not perceived setbacks which were based on um, my, my ethnicity. And I think part of that is because of the fact that I'm, I'm relatively young in this, this business of seeing and seizing opportunity. Uh, you know, the person that I am now is not the person that I was 10 years ago or, or, or so on. I mean, when I wrote Sexy, for example, I got two, I got five twos, two fours, and a five. I was a thorough delinquent when I was doing my first um, degree. I slept all day and then went to class and still only managed to get 2.9 GPA. Um, but apparently I did something, something right because my, my lecture at the time on Tuto, Mrs. Therese, uh, invited me to, to be a lecturer and then I started to develop, develop from there. So from that time come forward, I think that as I, as I, um, became more serious about myself, about work and started to hone my skills. And as I became more clear on what I wanted to do, ultimately my path sort of became stream doors just kept opening for me. So perhaps it's possible that I that so many doors opened up that I didn't see the ones that were closed to me by by virtue of um, my my ethnicity. So personally hey, as far as I could have seen, I can't say that it has. Well for me I could probably share one example of where I personally felt it had to do with my African um, ancestry, where an opportunity presented itself for me to be part of a workshop that was within my field. So I, I know it, it wasn't a case where I wasn't equipped to be a part of, of that particular workshop or I wasn't skilled enough because I was actually the only person doing this particular area. Um, and I was even the, the given a plaque for being the best employee of the year and all that. So I know it had nothing to do with my ability, but um, when it went up to upper management, because it was a request with my name actually on it to be part of this particular workshop, it came back where it was scratched out and somebody else's name who had nothing to do with what the workshop was necessarily about was, was selected. And that really hurt me because I felt as though it can't be anything that I did because this is my area. This is where I need the training in. So I felt that that was um, a form of discrimination, but I didn't let that keep me back. Um, and actually I, I was able to, as an individual and as part of, of my NGO, to be selected not as a result of my employment, but as a result of my volunteerism. So I think that's why it's, it's key not to just rely on your employer to create opportunities for you, but to seek them elsewhere. Thank you, Ms. Garner. Um, at Chevy, is it true that if I write my idea and mail it to myself, the open post marked mail can help prove that I had the idea, that I had the idea at that time. This is from Norwell. Um, yeah, that is proof. But the question is whether or not you can actually do anything about that in our jurisdiction. The, the question seems like it's um, probing the issue of intellectual property, intellectual property rights. Yes, it may be evidence of that, but even if you have evidence of an original idea before someone else started using it, um, unless there is a legal framework in place, <clears throat> sorry, which uh, allows for the protection of that intellectual property, then um, 
it, it, it doesn't necessarily lend to effective protection of your idea, which is why the best thing to do is to keep your idea secret until uh, you are able to put it into uh, effect. Guyana's copyright laws are very old. The statute which we use is not even necessarily our own. And that statute uh, was further modified several decades ago by the state which promulgated that particular statute. So it, it would be evidence, yes, but that does not mean that you would be able to stop somebody from producing or to, from reproducing whatever work it is that you are engaged in. Thank you, Mr. Devanish. Our last question for the night, since we're working with time constraints. This question is from Gabby. What are your thoughts on having a main job while being an entrepreneur on the side? Well, I think, I think this question to, is directed to our speaker. That also has to tie in with what your main job allows. Um, there's some jobs where you sign a contract that says you can't be engaged in any other type of uh, income earning while working at that particular job. So it depends on the kind of contract that we sign. But I think it's, it's always good to have a sort of side hustle um, because you need to look at, at multiple income streams. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that once it doesn't affect, like you, you shouldn't be doing it at work. If you, know, if you have a business, you shouldn't have your customers coming to where you work to uplift things. And it should not interfere with your work with, because in other parts of the world, people have multiple jobs. So if you have to work from uh, eight to four thirty, perhaps your entrepreneurship could be something done in the evening, into the night, um, and that way you have multiple income streams, more disposable income that will give you the opportunity to save and so on. And there's you don't necessarily have to start big. You could start small. I think sometimes we run away with the idea that we need like a couple million dollars before we start or even a hundred thousand dollars but you could start something with five thousand dollars and you ensure you get the profit from that let's say you make three thousand dollars on that and you keep turning that over and you build slowly slowly sell it to friends sell it to family sell it to workmates um if you go to church sell it to the congregation so there there are ways to earn and every little bit helps and you keep building on that that's it. I, I disagree. I don't think there's anything more for me to say. There. All right. Thank you. Um, Tommy Padiji from the International Decade of People of African Descent and the Youth Committee. We'd like to extend our gratitude and our thank you to both Ms. Garner and Mr. Chevy for finding the time to come and present us tonight and how to effectively see and seize our opportunities. Um, please remember to like our Facebook page, Epidogy Youth Movement and International Decade for People of African Descent Assembly, and our Instagram page, Epidogy's official Instagram page. Please be reminded to tune in next week, same time, same place, 7 o'clock, our Zoom meeting for our topic, Transitioning to Adulthood, next week, Thursday at 7 p.m. So again, thank you for all participants. Thank you to our FB family for tuning in. And we hope that you've learned something and you can take away something from our program tonight. Thank you for having